You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Richard Morton Jack. Okay, Richard, tell us the story about how you came to write this book and what part Nick Drake's family play in it. Um, well, I've known Callie, who, Callie Callerman, who manages Nick's estate for a long time as a friend. He's a fellow hopeless record collector. And um, he and Gabrielle, Nick's sister, have always had a fairly clear policy that they won't endorse any recreation of Nick's life on stage or on film, etc. Um, and they, as a way of trying to present all the material that they had, but didn't want to just open up to a film or whatever it might be, about 10 years ago put together a brilliant book of their own called Remembered for a While, which is a, it's a bit more than a scrapbook, but it's a non-linear presentation of all sorts of aspects of Nick's life. And I helped with that quite closely. And my feeling as soon as I saw the finished book, well, I'd thought it as I was working on it, but as soon as I saw the finished book, I thought this really needs to be a narrative as well for people who would find his story interesting. Um, and I said this to Gabrielle, and she said to me that if I wrote it, she'd be happy to let me do it. So that was the beginning of it. Um, and... Uh, I went through all of the stuff that they had and evaluated it, but with the huge bonus of being able to say to her, like, what's this piece of paper? I was in her house. And, and, and being able to um, contextualise every little oddment um, right. with other things and having her saying, no, that was the local GP or whatever it might have been, um, a name or a scrap of uh, a hotel address. And so um, it was a really useful being able to pick her brain. And I think she accepted um, slightly despite herself because she's always been very protective of, of Nick and of not wanting to seem to be up on high telling everyone else what is or isn't true. She, she accepts that there is no one Nick. Um, but she became increasingly aware that there were false narratives circulating yeah, about him. Yeah, there were lots him. of mis misconceptions about him that you wanted yes. to, to... What sort of things did you so, want Some to... of them are misconceptions yeah. and some of them are um, very unpleasant slurs. Yeah. Um, so, um, what kind he, of things did you want to rectify? Um, well, he was a heroin addict, is one of the stories that circulates. He was obviously must have been abused as a child because why would he write songs like that? And he went to prep school and boarding school, so clearly that must have happened. And uh, his parents were uh, aggressively opposed to his pursuing music and did whatever they could to prevent him from. Um, you know, that career path. I think there were various factual errors as well, which are neither here nor there, really, but cumulatively they distort the image, that, 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 that the truth of it. And because Nick is such an enigmatic person, I think Gabrielle and Callie realised that at least they could get the facts straight and people can infer what right. they will from, from a correct version of what, what is known. Um, so that was where I came in with Gabrielle and, and, and so she was very happy to sort of set things straight and so on but without pretending to be an oracle herself so give us a quick idea of the family we're looking at a picture of the you know, childhood the picture of the family now yeah. what, you know, give us an idea of what they were all about well they were a very unusual family for their time um, I think from all that I've been told because they were both outwardly conventional and inwardly quite unconventional um, there are lots of superficial assumptions that, of course, we all make about the past. Um, and I think one of them is that it was quite stolid and that there wasn't much affection and warmth between parents and children. In black and white photos, always look a little bit grim, yes. or often do. And, <laughs> and actually, the Drakes were, were a very conventionally um, happy family with uh, nice parents and nice children and thank you letters and good manners and punctual meal times and all this sort of stuff but beyond that there was a lot of artistic emphasis within the family that was even unknown to close friends of theirs or they might vaguely have understood that the Drakes quite liked recording songs that they wrote and but there wasn't I think a full understanding until much more recently of quite what an artistic well, Molly's atmosphere. some records and Molly's recordings her real to real recordings came out didn't they? Yes exactly yeah. um, so there was a and Nick's mother, although she wasn't herself depressive, as far as I'm aware, had a 
considerable streak of existential pity in her and, and she understood that life wasn't all a bed of roses and I think it's easy to look at her and assume she was just this perfect housewife yeah. um, and I think that's how she to an extent presented herself to their circle um, and I think it staggered quite a lot of Nick's friends latterly to realise that she was this fountain of existential songs and poetry um, as Mark says that surfaced more recently and Rodney Drake was an engineer, so he had a slightly more precise and um, factual mind, but he had a great sympathy for the arts and for... And, of course, the sister was an actress as well. Absolutely, it, it, yeah. It's an interesting kind of uh, corrective to the, the normal way that music biographies tend to work, is that is the, it starts with a family, and one member of the family is really interesting, and the other ones are just supporting characters. You yes. know what I mean? For the rest of the story. Whereas this story is it's about all of them really isn't it yes although i i was lucky enough to have access to information about all of them which yeah. which rounds out the picture because i think I, I recently read mick jagger's brother's memoir which is quite an interesting book but joe their father was a really interesting man yes and i just assumed he was a pe teacher bit of a martinet you know whatever you might see in a random article but actually reading mick's brother talking about him you realize that mick didn't come out of nowhere this was a very broad-minded interesting family. Yeah. And I'm sure the same goes for most rock stars' families. There's more Absolutely. to it than... Uh... So, so moving on to... So Nick goes to Marlborough School, college, whatever yeah. we call it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and is he, is he continuing to be the kind of, you know, normal young chap that, that might have been expected at the time? Or is he starting to show any signs of being different? Well, Nick was really fortunate. One of lots of strokes of good luck that he had in life obviously he also had terrible bad luck later on but one of the many little strokes of luck he had was that when he arrived at Marlborough um, in January 1962 he coincided with a new headmaster who was progressive and so the public schools in those days were still quite oppressive and quite Victorian in certain ways but they had this new headmaster called John Dancy who was uh, progressive. So he relaxed re hair regulations, he got rid of fagging, he got rid of corporal punishment, he made chapel voluntary. Little things that, that showed more sympathy to what was starting to be recognised as teenagers rather than just young mm. people who were going to start. Because he'd been quite conventional before that, hadn't he, really? I mean, sort of very, you know, I think he was yes. head boy of his first school. I can't remember now. He was head boy of his first yeah. school and, and, and was a outwardly golden child that's right um, it's lovely to read yeah. the thank you letters all the way through this book you know the, yes, the, people, well, the way people used to correspond in those days is it should be a lesson to us all <laughs> <laughs> so um so marlborough wasn't an oppressive environment that nick had to rebel against um and also the obvious thing was that music started becoming much more important to young people um as of the late 50s obviously and and um Nick was right there when, when things really started hotting up with Beatlemania during his first year there, and, and then um, onwards into the American folk revival, Dylan, etc. And um, one of the little discoveries that I made, I mean, it's nothing earth-shattering, but I was quite amused by it, was there's been this assumption that Nick learned all of these quite obscure American blues and folk songs by haunting doughbells and um, collets or whatever, and, and, and go, you yeah, know, buying folkways, imports, and so on. But I knew that those records were really esoteric then and really hard to get, and very unlikely that a 14, 15-year-old schoolboy was going to have this incredible blues record collection. of it. Lo and behold, almost every single one of these songs that Nick recorded in the early days of his singer, you know, singing and playing guitar are on Peter, Paul, and Mary albums. Yes. <laughs> Um, nobody talks about no, that. Man, no. from, man from Man, who's a you big fan. You don't get any roots well. points right. for talking about Peter, Paul and Mary, do you? No. <laughs> so it made perfect sense to me. They were doing the, uh, the hard work, and he was just singing, effectively, Peter, Paul and Mary songs, um, as were, obviously, you know, millions of and kids they, all over they, Europe. People and Mary were all, uh, all over the television, weren't they? They were, they were, they were, they were huge. They were but they were square, weren't they? They were right. really they, square, they were really definitely, yeah. definitely. So he goes to Cambridge... Yes, he, he, he was absolutely squished into Cambridge. I, I think he must have been, even by the standards of 
his day when it was a bit easier to get in if you had the right connections and the right background. Um, he was probably the least qualified Cambridge undergraduate of his generation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but he was an exceptional croquet player, wasn't he? So he was very have, good that at croquet. Help. <laughs> I, I don't mean that as an insult to his mind. Obviously, he had a very interesting mind. But in terms of his achievements versus some very hardworking person from a less privileged background who might have wanted his place, there's little sympathy for, for the way that he was got into Cambridge. Looking back on it, it, it was all done on a handshake and a wink between people who had uh, access to places at Cambridge but the great thing is that Nick did go to Cambridge from a from yeah the uh, looking at it with, with hindsight because Cambridge so informed his work not only as an influence on on his songs and on the atmosphere of his songs but because he had the time and the space to write them I mean reading English then perhaps now but certainly then at, at Cambridge was just a laugh. So he, did, he just sat in his room, basically, and played songs. Like yeah. 20 minutes of Tess of the Durbervilles, and exactly. then they'd start tuning up and just... T- yeah. Eight, eight. So you could turn up heat as much as you wanted, obviously, and there were highly thoughtful and inter- interesting um, undergraduates who were very focused on, on the subject. I don't mean to belittle it, but from Nick's perspective, obviously you can copy something out of a book and cobble it together and not get in trouble in a way you couldn't with philosophy or science or medicine right. or whatever so nick had this golden ticket basically he was at cambridge he was amongst pretty interesting people a lot of whom were like-minded and he was able to write songs he had a lot of time on his hands and a very supportive group of friends there who all thought he was great and so, started playing and working in a duo didn't he i think around that time well with yeah. robert kirby who who, yeah. who he met um in his second term who was nick, nick knew he wanted his songs to be arranged um Joe Boyd, he met in the January of his first year, so after his first term. And Joe had just heard the songs of Leonard Cohen, which was hot off the presses in America, but Joe had a copy over here. And Joe said to Nick, listen to this, I think strings might go well with... And and that absolutely rang a bell with Nick because he had a very strong interest in classical music anyway, and Nick could read music and could play classical instruments. So, um, So Nick got back to Cambridge and thought, I need to find someone who can write some arrangements with me and we can, not necessarily to the point where we're going to record them, but um, work together on, on seeing, just experimenting. And Joe had said to Nick, take time, I think you're great, but you're not ready to make an album yet. And I think one of the things that I'm really grateful to Joe for, as, as far as Nick goes, is that um, this was an era when singer-songwriter albums were coming out quite thick and fast. Yep. And... Nick was really good. There was no sense in which he was sort of maybe worth taking a punt on because he might get quite good in a few months' time. I mean, Nick was obviously very good straight away. By, the, by 1968, he already had an album's worth of pretty solid songs. Joe really easily could have just stuck Nick in front of a microphone and said, boom, two two-hour sessions, maybe get a bit of cello or something banged onto that, and that's the album. And lots of albums were made like that at that time. Yep. And Nick could have plausibly made a perfectly good, not particularly brilliant album straight away. And Joe said, no, let's wait, let's take time, let's give it a year, you can come, you can go, or come to Sound Techniques whenever you're ready, we'll fit you in, we'll put you together with some other people. Joe sort of heard it all in his head straight away, and I think that was another big stroke of luck for Nick. Let's talk about some of the other musicians that he, he encountered. So he, he was spending a lot of time travelling, wasn't he, in vacations and so forth. Spending a lot of time in France. and He ends up in Morocco at one stage, doesn't he? He meets the Rolling Stones. Tell yeah. Us I, I, I think there's one of the assumptions people have made about Nick is that he was always um, antisocial and sitting in a room feeling sorry for himself. And, and alas, that did become the case latterly, but he was a perfectly outward-facing teenager, a a little bit on the reticent side, but so are lots of people. Um, So, yes, he was a curious traveller, and he backpacked um, as a schoolboy around Europe and had the usual disasters and adventures. And um, as soon as he left school, he wanted to go to Africa, and that all fell apart because there there was political difficulties and and, uh, in Kenya where he wanted to go. So... This plan was sort of retrofitted that he'd have to go to the University of Aix-Marseille to 
study French, which was bizarrely part of the requirement of his Cambridge degree was that you had to do a French translation paper. So off went Nick there, but it was a bit of a repository for kids who had nothing better to do, um, this bogus course, which no one checked up on. Um, but as soon as Nick went there, he, he pootled off to Africa almost immediately. Um, and that must have been his plan. I don't know that, but clearly Nick must have agreed to go to X on the basis that it was quite near to Morocco. Um, and off he went within about three weeks of arriving in X and uh, had a brilliant time. It really opened up his mind, as it would to any young person, um, but it also um, informed his guitar playing and, and the, the postcards he sent home, he, he talks about the sights and the smells and so on, but it's really the sounds. But it's the confidence of, of, of selling himself to the Stones, isn't it? Of actually sort of going to, to meet them yes. and saying, this is, the, 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 you've got to hear my music. And he plays. He? Yes. He, he, he had a, the good fortune to be amongst a, a gang, one of whom was particularly confident and outgoing, who basically forced Nick on the Stones. So I think without that friend, Nick probably would have been a bit more reticent slash wouldn't in a million years have gone near them. But I do think it's instructive that Nick was willing to perform in front of not only Mick and Keith, but also Brian and Cecil Beaton and, um, you know, Stash and uh, whoever else was in that entourage, uh, Michael Cooper. Yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. fairly terrifyingly hip people. That, that's all wearing... a microcosm of swinging London, isn't it? Yeah. In, in a room. All bombed out of their minds, yeah. but... Uh, wearing ridiculous medieval clothes with sort of yeah. wolf furs and God knows what, yeah. just like the in a, yeah, the gatefold for Beggar's Banquet. Beggar's that must have been the scene. And Nick was sort of slightly shoved into the room with his guitar, but played and sang, and by all accounts was complimented, and Mick said to him, come and see us when you're back in London, which I don't know if Nick did or attempted to, and Mick was in jail when Nick came back to London anyway, so that was the end of that. But yes, I, I think... It, yeah, it, it's quite a good corrective to the assumption that Nick it never is. had any cojones. No one ever thought of him as being self-promotional. I mean, yeah. th- we'll get on to this later, but it is interesting. I want to talk, talk about the... Um, there aren't that many pictures of Nick Drake. Most of them taken by Keith Morris, I think. Mm. Uh, and yet, the, the visual image of Nick Drake seems to be one of the most powerful things about him, would you say? Yeah, I, th- I think the... The extent to which Nick's physical appearance informs and did inform in his lifetime people's response to him is, is, is quite important um, to acknowledge. Um, obviously, he was a very striking-looking bloke um, and carried himself in a, in a, in a self-contained... R- one of those people who was probably conspicuous because he was so unostentatious. And um, I think... Yeah, his images are... The, the, the images we have of him are very um, powerful. Um, and, yeah, partly it's because there aren't a huge number of them. Although, to be accurate, there are a huge number of them. They're just all quite similar to each other. Yes. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if only there were more in different contexts. Um, but, but I think, um, yeah, Nick, Nick's uh, image is, is really strong. And it's a bit like his early death. It's quite hard to unpick how important those things have been in, in the way that he's been picked up on since his death. Do you think also that um, a lot of his mystique or his continuing appeal owes a lot to the fact that we have no recordings of him talking? Uh, well, very few. Um, uh, do it. But okay. certainly no, no, no footage of him as an adult, I think, is the big one. The only footage of him is of him as a toddler um, and a newborn because this, again, is, this is such a rare thing nowadays, isn't it, in our culture? The idea that yes. anybody we be bothered about, that we can't look at them moving about. No, absolutely. And, and I think it would be completely wonderful if footage of Nick did surface, but at the same time it would, to an extent, perhaps demystify him. It they would wouldn't like him so, anymore. No. <laughs> um, and I, I occasionally people... Nick, again, one of the many little things which I find bring him to life for me, Nick was quite keen on humble pie... Um, the band. The band, yeah. Yes! Why wouldn't he be? Great right, band. Right. Um, so there's... Not very Nick Drake-like at all. No, but... Um, <laughs> Again, this is undermining his image, so be, be very careful here. I didn't know about that. Um, You'll never sell another record. Nick was a great fan of headphones, of listening to music on cans, and he used to say to friends... Yeah, lots of his friends remember him saying, listen to this, it's, yeah, it's amazing. And the two things that friends of his 
Because whenever the people tell me things like that, when I was working on the book, I'd say to them, well, give me an example. And the two songs that people, his friends remember him saying, you've got to listen to this, were Song for Our Ancestors by the Steve Miller Band, which obviously is designed for amazing trippy stereo when you're stoned, and um, Shaky Jake off the self-titled Humble Pie album, which is just <laughs> a ballsy rock and roll song. And uh, why wouldn't he like it? You know, I, I, I think There's another it, brilliant detail in the book about him listening to music with headphones on where he, he does it with his hand on the telephone because he doesn't want to miss a telephone call because actually he was really sociable in the early days. Yeah. He didn't realise. He was so desperate not to, to not be able to hear the telephone. He'd have his hand yeah, on it. Yeah, he wanted to have his cake and eat it. Yeah. There's a lot of speculation about uh, whether Nick Drake had a love life or mm. not. But he did, didn't he? And you, we're looking here at the picture of, uh, of one of his old girlfriends that, yeah. that you talked to for the book. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think it's, again, been assumed that Nick was asexual or gay. Um, and the idea that he was just heterosexual but not massively sexually motivated seems to have been left to one side. And that is what he was, as, as far as all the evidence of his friends and of anything else I've, I came across shows. You know, Nick was perfectly interested in relationships with girls as a teenager and so on, but unfortunately this curtain came down on so many aspects of his life when he became quite mentally ill. And one of the first victims of that was any sort of meaningful relationship, let alone with a, a significant other. Um, but in his uh, teens, um, yeah, he, he did have this particular girlfriend, Kirsty. Um, they had a lovely time together and um, did everything that young people do, romantically and otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm glad, I was glad to talk to her about it and to see that he did have that aspect to his life. I think people have, to an extent, reverse-engineered virginity from his music. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Nick was perfectly earthy. Right. So, Joe Boyd, we, we've touched on a bit, you know, Joe Boyd of the Witch Season Productions label... Fairport Convention, John Martin, all kinds of people. Hugely yeah. important person, you know, key person hmm. in, in keeping him on track in doing these, these three kind of strangely perfect albums, which are his, um, his memorial, really, I suppose. Yes. Was, was Joe, is Joe surprised by the kind of continuing interest in, uh, in Nick Drake? No. Um... <laughs> But nor is he arrogantly self-satisfied about having perceived that which others didn't. No. But Joe's feeling about Nick now is exactly what it always was, which is that this guy's great, he can't fail. And Joe's position on it is it's just taken people a lot longer than I thought it would. But that's yes. an interesting point because there's quite a bit of that in the book about people saying to him, Joe among them actually, that he was a bit of a genius. You know, and I wondered if that didn't affect his approach to the way he promoted himself. That if, if he'd been told by enough people that he was fantastically gifted, I think he expected the world to beat a path to his door. Yeah, Would that and, be and true? I don't think that's an unreasonable... Yeah. Especially when you're young and you don't realise that the world doesn't necessarily open up to you in the way that you think it will. Yeah. But, but, yeah, Nick was told very quickly by everyone, his friends, Joe, yeah. other people he encountered, Mick Jagger, yeah, you're good. Yeah, you know, you're seriously yeah, yeah. good. One of Nick, all of Nick's friends agree that Nick was the best singer-guitarist among them, and they all bashed around on guitar, some of them much better than others. Um, but one of Nick's friends, who's very good at the guitar himself, said to me, not only was Nick better than all of us at the guitar, he was better at the guitar than any of us were at anything or had ever met who yeah. <laughs> did anything well. Um, you know, it was so, he was so obviously out of their league. And Joe recognised this, and so when Joe realised Nick could also write interesting and unusual songs in interesting and unusual tunings and was improving all the while. Joe just thought, well, I've found something completely amazing here. Yeah, yeah. and of course, first album comes out, nothing, crickets, as far as commercial response is concerned. Mm. A few nice reviews, everybody agrees it's kind of nice, but nobody buys it. Yeah. But also, uh, no promotion really, was there? I mean, he had a PR girl, and I think the PR girl said, would you like to do some interviews? He said, no, thanks. And, uh, and so, you know, yeah, there was that... an interview with Sounds on the second album, but I mean, at that point, no, there was, and there was no manager, and there was no agent, and there was no, no one really behind him. No, but I, again, it's quite easy to reverse engineer things from that, because 
Joe had had this amazing global success yeah. with the Incredible String Band. Yeah. I'm not saying they had number one hits and screaming girls everywhere they went, but they were a yeah, top ten albums. Yeah. Yes, and they, were and they were recognised at the time in Albert certain Hall. quarters as being you know, the next big songwriting thing since the Beatles. You know, they were taken quite seriously by critics and the Times and so on. So I think Joe's model seemed to have been quite successful in the past that which season his company did it all in house and you but the critical thing that Nick didn't do was get out there and flog yeah, was, up yeah. and down the country playing gigs and um, partly it's because I think he was temperamentally unsuited to it partly it's because he quite realistically saw that it was a bit of a waste of his time yeah. um, but I think if you didn't do that in those days everyone I've spoken to agrees everyone who worked in the but business but it all starts it was, really you know, well doesn't you it you got a description of the festival hall gig where I think we were supporting John and Beverly, the Fairport Convention. Beverly Martin the Fairport mm. Convention there's that one as well and, and those go really well don't they and then, and then certain things seem to happen that shake his confidence yes I think the Fairport gig that, that you can see this small ad for on the screen now was in a sense unfortunate because Fairport had had this terrible crash in May of 69 and had regrouped with a new drummer and this was their first proper concert. They'd done a warm-up, you know, but this was their first big concert and there was an enormous sense of support in the audience, which Joe and others remember. It, was, it wasn't your normal gig with people milling around and drinking and chatting and tolerating the support act, waiting for the main act. It was a reverential atmosphere because they understood the emotional charge of the evening. And I think Nick, who was very nervous, it was the first big concert he'd ever played, um, went on stage with that hush, with that sort of willingness to give him a go uh, for the audience to listen properly to him. And um, that wasn't a realistic experience. No, right. Never going to happen again, no. is it? Right. Because you, you recount stories of him playing the strangest gigs. He plays a, a kind of engineer's, engineering company's party at a rugby a club rugby somewhere club. In, yeah. in Warwickshire, doesn't he? How, yeah. how did that happen? You'd think somebody... Had sort of Nick had a great mate at Cambridge called Marcus Bicknell, who was one of several people important people who immediately recognised his talent. Marcus was a musician and a music scholar himself at Cambridge and, and he, he could tell that Nick was great. So he wanted to help Nick and he was part of that gang at Cambridge anyway. So when he left Cambridge himself, um, he went to work for a live promoter in London, um, Terry King. Mm -hmm. And um, one of his briefs as a lowly agent in this sort of grubby Soho office was filling up bills at working men's clubs in the Midlands. That was just one of the things they did. I've got just got the, the perfect answer. guy for you. <laughs> and um, usually you it was Tell some mother-in-law jokes. And then, yeah. Right. So usually it was 50s rock and roll type yeah. acts, the Wild Angels, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. But um, occasionally there'd be another spot on the bill and, and Marcus, as a favour to Nick as his mate, would say to him, look, this is going to be horrible but you'll get 20 quid and it might be a bit of a laugh and are you up for it? And so Nick, in the Christmas of 1969, did about three or four of these working men's gigs and according to Marcus, they were a laugh. There was one, Genesis, who had released their first yes. album and were in uh, flux, um, were also on the books of this agency and would do gigs with Nick. And there was one gig at a working men's club in the Midlands where Nick and Genesis were on the bill and Genesis, skinheads invaded sort of through the fire doors and Genesis had to play the hokey cokey for go. about 20 minutes at the threat of having Peter their heads Gabriel with in. a giant floral headdress <laughs> right. on. Yeah. Um, so, so I think this false narrative has arisen that Nick was yeah. put in for these completely inappropriate gigs and little wonder that he hated performing. But the reality was that he, was, he went into those with his eyes open and people, one or two people have said, oh, he played three or four songs and then left the stage as if... But that was all he was meant to do, ten right. minutes. We must ask you about Francois Zardy, who appears three times in the book. And just, just tell us the story of, of his... Well, it's, he was it's obsessed. It's sort of obsession, with really, isn't it? Yeah. To, to Again, understandable, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, of yeah. course, that's... To one... Uh, yeah, she was like Bardot, wasn't she? She yeah. occupied a very special exotic cachet for yeah, yeah. Yeah, that generation. But she, to her great credit, somehow 
encountered Five Leaves Left quite quickly in the autumn of 69 and thought it was great and name dropped it here and there. And Joe and the lady who ran the publishing in, for, for, for him um, were obviously always alert to any possible support that for any of their artists from an, un, uh, you know, an unlikely quarter that could be helpful. So they set up a meeting between Nick and Francoise on the basis that maybe she'd record one of his songs. And indeed, she was in the habit of recording songs by up-and-coming songwriters and all sorts. So Nick and Joe and a friend of, well, another producer called Tony Cox, because Joe's plate was already too full, so Joe said to Tony Cox, well, maybe you can come and we'll see what happens here. Maybe we can make an album with her or maybe we can work something out. So off they went to Paris, but unfortunately Nick kept his trap firmly shut during the meeting and um, nothing came of it. But this, this was in April, May of 1970, by which time, although no one realised it, not a soul, things were starting to go quite badly wrong in Nick's head. Um, so outwardly, people were expecting him still to be the 1969 Nick, but over the course of 1970, things started going quite badly awry with him. And this is one of the sort of obvious signs of it to me, that he sat during this meeting with her completely silently, and Joe was just thinking, what the hell? We've flown to Paris to sell you here. You've got to infuse, you've got to have some sort of engagement. Um, so nothing came of it, but as Nick's illness progressed, um, he fixated on the idea of working with or for or writing something or recording something for with Francoise. And, and it's rather poignant um, putting it together and seeing the way that at his very lowest ebbs, he had suddenly tried to go off to Paris to see her again and to knock on her door or to go to a session of hers when she was in London. And she obviously represented something to him. And I, it was far more than him just fancying her or being tongue-tied by her fame. I think she was the closest he had come to a mainstream artist taking a strong interest in him. And I think he thought she was one of the keys that might unlock the door again. And... Um, at the very end of his life, he was in Paris, um, and the lady on whose houseboat he was staying, who yeah, hasn't spoken to anyone about Nick until I spoke to her, the first thing she said to me was, oh, he was always saying that he wanted to talk to Francoise Hardy, and he, only, he had to meet her, and that that was the whole reason that he... he re so she obviously represented something very important to him, but he didn't articulate it, and nothing ever happened, and she is as baffled as anyone by it. Right. How many people do you talk to in the course of doing this book? Uh, well, a, a couple of hundred. Right. Yeah, getting on for a couple of hundred. Right. And were, were there people who, who, who thought about him a lot in the, in the 40, 50 years, or were there, were there people who hadn't? Well, of course, the most valuable people to talk to are the people who come to it completely cold. Um, there was one chap that he went to Morocco with um, who I spoke to and, and I said I just want to talk to you about Nick Drake and he said who and I said Nick Drake and he said I don't know anyone called Nick Drake sorry how did you get my number you know and I said um you you travel to Morocco with him and he played the guitar and he was a tall and he said oh yeah I remember, oh Nick yeah oh yeah I remember him yeah and I said um well he became quite a famous person and he died yeah oh that's sad what uh, uh tough. anyway he had so his memories when they started coming back were completely fresh and, and completely credible, whereas stories get worn in the this telling, obviously, it. and um, end up, obviously, for, for very understandable reasons, people um, forget what is or isn't the actual truth And I suppose it must have been particularly difficult to, to tell this chap that he became famous years after he died. Absolutely, yeah. It's even it more is such an unusual thing, isn't it? Curious. Yeah. And, and, and this chap, as a footnote said to me, oh, and I recorded Nick playing for the Rolling Stones. I had that tape for ages, but I threw it away. And I, and I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> Can you he was imagine? like, why would I possibly have kept it? You know, in the 1990s, what, he just did a clear out. It? It was, what was it then that, that sort of brought about? There was, a, there was a radio documentary, wasn't there, with Brad Pitt in 2004? And then there was a Volkswagen commercial. Yes, were, were those... I think there's been a sort of steadily radiating interest. And there's this magic trick has somehow happened with Nick that there's an assumption still amongst people that he's a cult artist and that he's... Yes. But 
I mean, he isn't. He is as famous as Neil Young or Bob Dylan to people who like that sort of music. He's as familiar a name and an image, and, and um, yeah, his body of work is much smaller. But I think people who come to Nick's work for the first time now still feel that they've discovered someone obscure, and I'm not quite sure how that works. I think it's to do with the intimacy of his yes, music and the, the private relationship people form with it quite, quite quickly. But, um, but yes, he, he is not, I would say, an obscure or cult artist now. Uh, oh, he's not Bob Dylan, that was an exaggeration, but he's far from... No, the people he's, like to say that. They 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 like to say you probably never heard of him, but you know, it's right. Nick Drake or whatever. Yeah, you know, would, they would hate to think that he was yeah, really, really fed up when you have heard of him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, but it, it's an ex, it's an extraordinary story, and I thought I knew a certain amount about him, but nothing compared to to what I learned in reading this book, which apart from anything else, as I think I've told you before, is that one of the things I love about it is it, it summons up. London in the late 60s and early 70s when people you know, took three buses to go around to people's houses to listen to records or whatever and uh, you know nobody had a mobile phone or even a phone in their home um, it, it summons that up absolutely brilliantly I think it's a remarkable piece of work oh well thank you Nick, Nick I think for me that the really important thing that I hope comes across in the book is that Nick was a real person he wasn't an iconic shadowy unreal figure you know he he ate he drank he slept he had relationships he laughed at benny hill and some others do have them quite a lot um you know he 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 participated in the world in the way that we all do and i think to be able to put more flesh onto those bones was was my task that's how I saw it and to make him into a real person for people rather than this sort of wraith that has somehow been assumed that he was well you certainly did that thanks for talking to us about it Richard Morton Jack this podcast is brought to you by The Word Thank mm-hmm. you.